Thank you very much. Next, we'll have Mark Safran. He is very experienced in hyperphroscopy and has done a lot of research in understanding biomechanics of FAI from Stanford. Thanks. I want to thank uh, Victor and uh, Dr. Bird for inviting me and asking me to come speak about the logic and treatment of CAM and pincer uh, lesions in FAI. And uh, this is a potential conflict of interest. I'm a consultant for Cool Systems in Ross Creek, and we receive fellowship support at Stanford from Smith and Nephew. And so I'm going to kind of go over the femoral acetabular impingement types and associated pathologies, talk about the relationship of FAI and OA, as some people use that as the rationale for doing the surgery. Hopefully I'll prove that there's, not more, there's more than one type of FAI, and in fact, certainly more than just one type of uh, CAM or pincer. Talk about treating the pathology and individualizing your, the treatment for your patient. And certainly we've all seen this uh, slide from uh, Gans's group in uh, uh, Switzerland, where you talk about the pincer with the overcoverage on the acetabular side, the cam lesion on the femoral side, a loss of offset at the head and neck junction, and then combined type of impingement. But not all FAIs are the same. And certainly, again, from Gonza's group, and, and this has been my experience and the experience of others, CAM lesions as an isolated phenomenon are more common than isolated pincer lesions, but the vast majority of people have combined some degree of CAM and pincer, though I think when you find that the pathology, one type will oftentimes predominate. And so here are some examples of some CAM type of lesions, a 3D CT scan showing this uh, lesion with a kind of a cleft uh, between the head and the, uh, and the bump and the head neck offset. Um, here's an, a lateral uh, view, uh, AP view showing that there's a lateral uh, projection from the head. And this one's a little bit different than, say, this patient where you have even more so. And then you even have the phenomenon where you have a short neck uh, and can impinge in the short neck or if even in a, a varus type of neck causing uh, an impingement. But still, even still, here's again another patient with a, more of a lateral type of uh, bump as you see on the AP. But um, when you look at the lateral, has even more so, a more prominent uh, bump uh, that would impinge in flexion. And again, some more examples, 3D CT scans showing this one with, again, a, a bump very clearly just anteriorly uh, without much uh, laterally. Uh, and then again, here's some other examples, and you just see the varying morphologies of uh, CAM impingement that have not been really uh, subdivided. And then pincer, the same thing. We certainly know they has been described by the Swiss about uh, overcoverage of the acetabulum, and you can have it as a result of coxa profunda, where the uh, floor of the acetabulum hits the ilioischial line and goes beyond it. You can have uh, protrusio, where the femoral head gets to or goes beyond the ilioischial line. You can have uh, relative retroversion of the superior aspect of the acetabulum or actual retroversion itself. Uh, this is a re cranial retroversion. You can have um, ossification of the labrum, from either partial or complete, that can also contribute to uh, the pincer type of impingement. And again, as we were talking about, you can have a true retroversion, or you can have, sometimes even have a cranial retroversion with some mild dysplasia. So there's a variety of different types of uh, pincer impingement as well. And again, you have a variety of pathologies. You can have damage here. You could see this patient has a loss of offset at the head and neck junction on this MRI. You see a rounded labrum. You see some labral chondral separation. You see some articular cartilage damage on the superior aspect of the acetabulum. You have some notching in the femoral neck. And you can have varying degrees of these different pathologies in different patients. Here's a so-called Pitt's Pitt, which was originally thought to be a normal variant. But this seems to be related at a higher incidence in impingement. And so the way we try to think about the pathophysiology of CAM impingement is that as you try to bring the leg up, up uh, and you have loss of this offset of the femoral head and neck junction, this leads to labral chondral separation, and then it abuts the articular cartilage, leading to softening and potentially delamination. And ultimately, it may uh, lead to loss of the articular cartilage to show this at a little bit um, higher magnification, as it were, schematic. But again, this is a schematic. Again, as you try to bring the leg up, you've got the, uh, as the lesion comes underneath, you get a labral chondral separation, and then the abutment against the articular cartilage that would potentially lead to a delamination type of uh, injury. And this is to be contrasted with the pincer impingement, where the neck basically crushes the, uh, the labrum against the acetabulum itself, and then you can get a contracool lesion on the posterior femoral head or, in, or posterior inferior acetabulum, which can occur a third of the time. So here in, in a section view, you can see the labrum getting crushed, and then it starts to lever, and you get a posterior uh, lesion as well. So the presumed natural history of an FAI patient, according to the Swiss group, is that the abnormal hip morphology leads to impingement that leads to articular cartilage damage, uh, rim degeneration, and a potentially global arthritis. 
However, and if you look in the literature, certainly people have talked about um, uh, the anatomy of impingement being associated with arthritis. Goodman with what he described as subclinical uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis and this loss of concavity, what you'd see with the cam impingement occurring very frequently in those with arthritis under the age of 55. Murray in 65 talked about the pistol group deformity, which again looks like a cam impingement. And Harris said 40% of those with idiopathic arthritis had the anatomy of a pistol grip. So there is, seems to be an association between this cam type of impingement and arthritis. Uh, and when you, the Swiss group has also shown that they feel that the bump or loss of offset at the head and neck junction is the cause but not, and not the result of the repetitive trauma from the impingement leading to the arthritis. And certainly when I see some of my patients, this is a 20-year-old gentleman that has uh, had hip impingement, femoral, uh, if, uh, cam type impingement, you see a nice delamination of the articular cartilage here. And so you see these changes in young people that you would expect would progress to osteoarthritis, that this might become a loose body. You end up having wear of the articular cartilage against the, the bone of the acetabulum, leading to premature arthritis. And so that would make some inherent sense. However, at the same time, we do a lot of research looking at kinematics of the hip. And I've certainly had some patients in their 70s that don't have arthritis of the hip and have clear anatomy of, of impingement. Here's a 90-year-old specimen uh, that we were doing some studies on. And clearly, you can see this loss of offset of the anterior femoral head neck junction. And the articular cartilage looks pretty darn good. So I think certainly the anatomy of impingement puts the patient at risk for arthritis. But you have to be involved in activities that take your hip through a full range of motion that would potentially lead to the impingement. And that would lead to the breakdown of the tissues. And at that point is when I think you need to consider operating on the patient for the impingement. And so also in, in uh, in sporting activities, we know for the impingement position, you flex, adduct, and internally, rotation, uh, internally rotate for the impingement sign. If you run, what ends up happening is you're flexing the hip, you're adducting and internally rotating uh, before uh, and when you're in the swing phase, and that obviously can lead to impingement, which is why I think we see this a fair amount in uh, running athletes or in athletes involved in sports that require running. So you have good clearance, you're able to go through without any problems, but when you have over coverage of the acetabulum or loss of offset, you would impinge as you bring the hip into flexion, adduction, and internal, internal rotation with running. So, I, But I think it's a leap of faith as to whether we can actually prevent osteoarthritis. Even if we do think that it does lead to arthritis, I don't know of an operation yet that prevents arthritis. Certainly what you want to do is relieve the abutment and improve the clearance to help the range of motion, but also to, and you also want to treat the associated pathology, the labral tears and the chondral lesions. And so with the labrum, your options are to debride or to repair. For the uh, cam lesion, you want to do your chelectomy or osteoplasty. For your pincer lesion, you want to do your acetabuloplasty. And for the chondral lesion, you want to do either a, a abrasion or a microfracture. When, one of the things, if you look at the literature, certainly classically, we talk about 60 to 95 percent good to success, good to excellent success rate with labrectomies. Uh, but most of this data occurred before we actually understood about impingement. And if you look at the data that does understand about impingement, Tanzer showed that only a quarter of his patients that he did arthroscopic partial labrectomies on did well, and 97% of these people had untreated FAI. More recent work, uh, Kim from Korea had 43 patients that he reviewed retrospectively at a little over four years. He looked at those that had arthroscopic labrectomies. Those that had anatomy of impingement that, were, that was not treated did worse than those that didn't have the anatomy of impingement. And more recently, Ricky Villar had 51 patients, 24 that he did labrectomy with a chelectomy, and 47 that did not have a chelectomy and found at a one-year evaluation that the likelihood of having a good, excellent result was much better in those that had the arthroscopic femoral osteoplasty or chelectomy as compared to those that did not. And so I think in addition to treating the uh, labral pathology, you have to treat the underlying cause, which uh, we feel is the impingement. And so the way you do this, you want to correct the deformity at which was causing the impingement and the d damage. You talk about not wanting to create a deformity to cr compensate for a deformity. So if you have a problem on the acetabular side, I think you need to do your acetabuloplasty and remove the excessive bone or over coverage. And on the femoral side, you want to remove the femoral head and neck uh, bump and try to restore that offset. I don't think you want to address a patient that has pincer impingement by just increasing their offset at the, uh, at the femoral head and neck junction. So here's just our, uh, radiographic views of, of one of my first patients that we did back in 2002 uh, with impingement, trying to restore the offset. But I don't think it necessarily has to be as aggressive as uh, this one was. And here's another case that we uh, recently did that had a slip capital femoral epiphysis with a significant uh, loss of offset that we went ahead and restored uh, the offset. And with this, you do a dynamic assessment to make sure that you have clearance. Yeah, I think you can do this with most degrees of uh, pincer impingement. This is a patient with protrusio. Um, 
uh, the center edge angle is 62 degrees. Uh, and here you can see just by removing some of the lateral and anterior lateral head neck junction, uh, uh, acetabulum, this patient was extremely satisfied and went on to have her other hip done arthroscopically as well. So we talk about open versus arthroscopically. The advantage of open is the gold standard. You can see all the way around. You can use templates to help you. It may or may not be faster. Based on Brian Kelly's study, it suggests it might be faster. However, it's prolonged hospitalization, blood, a, a risk of blood loss, AVN risk, trochanteric nonunion risk, a higher incidence of heterotopic ossification and prolonged use of the crutches for the trochanteric osteotomy. And when you compare this to arthroscopically, you can do, I think, an equal resection. It's easier to address the intraarticular pathology. You can do this as an outpatient procedure with minimal blood loss and minimal crutch use. Um, but the disadvantages is it's a steep learning curve. You get, it can be an orientation issue, particularly in the peripheral compartment, and it may take longer to do the surgery and then there are risks of arthroscopy. When you look at the outcomes in the, in the literature, there's a lot of mixed bag uh, information in the literature, but basically if you look, there's over 800 cases of arthroscopically treated FAI in the literature with a 3% failure rate with evidence of those that have arthritis to do worse and that the alpha angle does not correlate to the to restoration of alpha angle does not correlate to outcome. When you look at the open surgical dislocation risk uh, surgeries, only 179 cases are reported in the peer-reviewed literature, 18% failure rate. So basically, FAI isn't, I think, an important cause of pain uh, in the patient. It may be associated with earlier arthritis, but our understanding is still evolving, as is the treatment. I think you want to, I think it is a surgical problem, however. I think you can do this arthroscopically or open, but I think you have to treat the impingement as well as the pathology, and it's unclear as whether or not we can prevent arthritis. Thank you.